we had, in addition to Captain Bowen, um, who, who passed away on July 28th, and Jay Betancourt, who uh, was flown to Burn Center, we also had eight other firefighters who were injured that day. Stay tuned. Coming up, it's a flashback to episode 44 in part two of my two-part interview with Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett, sharing the details of the tragic line of duty death of Captain Jeff Bowen. But first, let's hear from our amazing sponsor, Midwest Fire. Every day, the hardworking men and women at Midwest Fire build the most reliable firefighting apparatus to be found anywhere. Their customers know a well-built fire engine means lives and property saved. Midwest Fire, a factory direct manufacturer dedicated to helping you extinguish fire before it becomes a raging beast. To learn more about what fuels their passion, visit MidwestFire.com. Hello and welcome to the Situation Awareness Matters Show, episode 341. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gassaway Virtual Training. We have 33 online training programs for your members. Some of these programs are live events presented virtually, and some of them are pre-recorded programs. To learn more, visit samatters.com website and click on the Virtual Training tab. All right, let's jump into today's feature segment, a flashback to episode 44 and part two of my two-part interview with Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett, sharing the details of the tragic line of duty death of Captain Jeff Bowen. One note before we begin, this interview was recorded before I was doing the show in the video format, so my discussion with Chief Burnett is audio only. As we left off, Chief Burnett was talking about the benefit of having a command aide, or what they called a command technician, and the benefits that his department have uh, achieved from having that position on structure fire incidents. So that's where we're going to pick up at. As, as you said, it prevents the incident commander from becoming task saturated. On July 28th, we missed a second alarm. That's one example of many things that we missed. And, and <laughs> you sit there and think, how in the world could we have missed a second alarm that it did not get dispatched? That, that does not occur in 2015 at the Ashton Fire Department because we have that command technician that um, is able to monitor the radio traffic, monitor the dispatch channel. The command technician is able to monitor the air supplies of the firefighters that are inside the building. They're able to monitor the locations. The incident commander focuses on strategies and tactics and decision making. The incident commander does not have to get bogged down with the additional tasks of tracking and making sure that, that when things are ordered, they're delivered, all of those things the command technician is able to, to pick up using that tactical worksheet and making sure the benchmarks are met and, and keeping that, that um, incident commander from getting overloaded with the tasks that they must accomplish. Another amazing thing for that command technician is in the event of a mayday, that incident commander can manage that day. And the command technician, who has been right beside that incident commander through the entire incident, can take over on another channel being the incident commander for the incident. And it's seamless, and they're already in the loop with the priorities, the objectives, the tactics, the benchmarks that have been met, the ones that still need to, to be obtained, and it lets that incident commander manage that, that May Day. There's so many benefits of that command technician every fire department needs to have that we do not staff that just like i used in my example when i thought early in my career that wow it would be nice to have so much staff that we can have somebody that drives the chief around we, we don't staff the command technician as a dedicated position we, one of our on-duty safety officers that's always on duty 24 hours a day the, the shift safety officers 
We have two, and they're dispatched to every report of a fire, and the first arriving safety officer assumes the role of safety officer. The second arriving safety officer assumes the role of command technician, and they've been trained um, as in that command technician role. The other important part for incident management and, and doing our critical tasking, we learned um, how much more effective and safe it makes a scene is when we have that second battalion chief on scene. First arriving battalion chief assumes the role of incident commander. Second arriving battalion chief assumes the role of either division or group supervisor. Such a valuable position. We had an incident um, almost a year ago um, that really proved the value of that group supervisor. Um, we had an incident that was seemingly straightforward, and we had a flashover. We had some firefighters that were close to becoming trapped, and we had a firefighter that um, was unaccounted for. And had we not had that group in place, then we would have had a, a really uh, bad outcome at that incident. The total number of incident management team members that we send working structure fires four. We send an incident commander, a command technician, division and group supervisor, and a safety officer. Huh. When it comes to staffing RIT, as I, I talked about Phoenix Fire Department's um, research, the, um, the, the, they had determined that 13 firefighters is what was needed to rescue one down firefighter. We did an extensive critical task analysis for rapid intervention this past summer. And one of our firefighters, Trey Young, uh, an amazing um, firefighter in our department who is very passionate about RIT, he, he led this study, this critical task analysis. And we learned quite a bit. We we reaffirmed the information that Phoenix had identified and that, that the minimum needed is, is 13. But we also found out a lot about RIT and that if firefighters were not specifically trained in RIT, then they were far less effective in a rapid intervention evolution. We measured 179 of our person. and doing RIT evolutions. And what we found were one in three firefighters got themselves in their own Mayday situation trying to rescue a down firefighter when they weren't trained for RIT. The ones who were specifically trained for RIT, we had zero Mayday situations. My thoughts on RIT, my fire service career, were that RIT is a function that any good solid firefighter could perform. And if you were a good, sound firefighter, then you would be good at RIT. And so you put your best firefighters in charge of RIT and the task is gonna get done very well. That was my thought. That is not true at all. That same logic is you take your best firefighters who are very good at firefighting and they are going to be able to mitigate hazardous materials emergency, or they're going to mitigate a rescue evolution. Those firefighters have to be trained on those disciplines. RIT is as much of a discipline as rescue, hazmat, EMS, all of our specialty disciplines, RIT is just like that. And if you're not specifically trained for RIT, then you are going to take twice as long to get the down firefighter out and you're going to have a 33% chance of getting yourself in your own Mayday situation. We were able to prove that by measuring um, our firefighters going through these RIT evolutions. So two important things to remember for RIT. One, make sure your RIT is adequately staffed. And then two, make sure that your RIT is adequately trained. Most departments, when they staff RIT, they send two there's many departments that have an RIT of two members. Some departments have a four-person RIT, which is good. Well, the reality is, is 
Phoenix proved, and then we, we reaffirmed Phoenix data with our own, that it takes a minimum of 13. If we know that it takes a minimum of 13, why would you not have 13 firefighters there ready to do RIT? <coughs> Staffing always is an issue, and, and a lot of fire chiefs tell me, I understand what you're saying, but where do you get these firefighters from? If you don't have them on your own department to be able to respond, use automatic aid. Use mutual aid. This, this country is, is filled with one and a half million firefighters, and we all like going to fires. And so use automatic aid as far and wide as you need to to be able to get 13 firefighters on scene just for that task of RIT. We all like going to fires, and if you use automatic aid, we can get those firefighters there. Do you do you have thirteen as a RIT team now? We do. We actually have more than that. Um, what how we function for RIT is we train specialty train three of our companies. We have sixteen um, companies. We also have a daytime company, so that's our seventeenth company. And three three of our engine companies. Um, one we have three battalions in Asheville, and there's one in each battalion. That's minimum staff with four firefighters, and they're specially trained. Their mission is RIT. They do two things. They do engine company operations, and they do RIT operations. There's the only two things that they're focused on, not hazmat, not rescue. Of course, they have the baseline, the basic um, hazmat operations, basic rescue technicians, <laughs> all of those things. But, but they don't have any other specialties other than engine company operations and RIT. That's what they train on every day they come to work. And so when we have a report of a fire, then one of those RIT engines from another battalion is dispatched as RIT because they're going to be the ones that are the, the RIT for that battalion. They're going to be first due, they're doing first due operations. So if the fire is in battalion one, then battalion two's RIT engine is going to respond as RIT, and that's a four-person RIT. Once a working fire is declared, then we dispatch an RIT group. And that RIT group includes two more and one more ladder, just for the purpose of RIT. Those two engines in that ladder, when they arrive on scene, they meet up with the RIT engine. The RIT officer for that engine becomes the RIT group leader at that point. And then we have between 15 and 16 firefighters there for that RIT task. And they're not there doing nothing by any means. We do proactive RIT. They do a 360 RIT size up. One member of the RIT group <laughs> is right there with command, um, hearing everything that's going on and able to uh, get immediate direction from command as they hear radio traffic coming in, either a low air emergency or um, a mayday or any type of emergency communication. The other members of the RIT, they're staging equipment. They're staging their RIT tools. They're doing a 360 RIT size up to look for anything that is going to impede the emergency egress of a firefighter. What they're also doing is they are creating secondary means of egress. Every opening on a multiple floor structure fire has a ladder or secondary means of egress. When you're hanging from a window, that's not the time to, to holler and say, hey, bring me a ladder off of the engine. It's not even time to holler, hey, bring me that ladder from the window to windows down. When it's your tail that is getting burned up, you're the one, you want that ladder at that window right there when you're trying to get out of it. And so that's what the RIT is also doing, is they're, they're putting those ladders up on that second floor or that third floor, wherever, however many stories that fire is. Okay. What other changes have come about? You mentioned RIT, staffing, critical tasking. Let me look back at my notes. Uh, health and wellness. Health and wellness um, is, is huge. We had, in addition to Captain Bowen, um, who, who passed away on July 28th, and Jay Betancourt, who uh, was flown to Burn Center, we also had eight other firefighters who were injured that day. Of those eight firefighters that were injured, 
three were admitted to the hospital. They were all transported to the hospital, but three were admitted to the hospital, and, and one was in the hospital for three days. Many of those injuries were related to health and wellness. When one of your own is down, firefighters aren't going to stop. We know that. That's a given. Firefighters are not going to stop until they have their brother or they have their sister out of harm's way. And so what we did on July 28 is our firefighters, they worked themselves to complete exhaustion to the point where the firefighters, this was a 90-degree day here in North Carolina on July 28th. It was the middle of the day. Firefighters would come out from searching for Captain Bowen and Jay Betancourt. They would come out, they would lift up their face mask, they would vomit as they were getting their SCBA bottle filled, and then they would put their mask back on and go right back in. Firefighters in our country, in the fire service, firefighters are not going to stop. They're going to work themselves to death, literally, or to an injury into the hospital. So we realized quickly that health and wellness needed to be a huge focus for our department because if we know that we're going to be put in these situations then we need to be as physically fit and as healthy as possible to keep ourselves from having a cardiovascular event or having a pulmonary event or having some type of situation when when that day comes we we talk a lot about everyone goes home and added to that we want everyone to go home from every shift and also enjoy a long, healthy retirement, which health and wellness is a big part of. We're doing ourselves a, a huge disservice if we don't focus on health and wellness of, of our firefighters. So we, we, we've changed our health and wellness culture within our department. We learned quickly that the, the, the psychological trauma surrounding a line of duty death is treated much better through health and wellness. The recovery is so much better when you're physically fit and when you're healthy. So there's a lot of reasons that, that health and wellness is, is important. And what we did was we, we created a guideline that, that mandated um, one hour of physical activity every single shift. And we, we, we heard some anxiety from that from some in our department because they were concerned that um, it might be the precursor to, to something else down the road, um, punitive um, testing, th things of that nature. And what, what our goal was and what we explained and communicated to our department and it was certainly um, accepted by our department was we, we want to be healthier and we want to be more physically fit. And none of our physicians do not tell us when we go and see them for an annual physical or whenever that we need to be exercising three to five times a week for 30 minutes. Every one of our physicians tell us that. And so it's good for everybody, and it's something that we should be doing for, for health and wellness. And so that, that in itself um, certainly allows our department to focus more on health and wellness and, and changing that culture of um, making sure that we are physically fit. A good example of, of how that culture has changed, um, even our administrative personnel that work days, uh, we, we, we give them an hour every single day to um, do physical fitness. And other city employees um, had made comments, you know, wow, I, you know, I see your firefighters out that are, that are working days, Monday through Friday schedule, they're out running in the afternoon. Um, you know, that's, how can they get away with that? And my response is, well, why isn't your department doing that? There's many, many studies that prove a healthy and physically fit employee is far more productive, has a much less impact on the health care fund and the, the, the insurance costs for the employer. So there's, there's, there's no downside, no negative to having a culture of a physical fitness and wellness. Scott, I, yes, go ahead. I had a um, conversation just recently with a firefighter from a, uh, I'd say, a reasonably sized department. I think they serve a population of 100,000 or so, and he was giving me a tour of his station. 
and he took me upstairs and he showed me the workout area and it was just it was beautiful i mean just really nice equipment he said yeah he says we got a we got a grant and then we got uh donation that helped us to get this equipment and he says and we just just about no more than got it in and installed and somebody from the city's risk management department said the firefighters are not allowed to use any of this equipment while they're on duty because they might get hurt and i'm sure as i say this there are firefighters out there who are saying yep that's that's how it is in our city what would you say to that 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 is a real concern in every department i would assume would face that and and here here's the approach that were, was very successful for us all members of the public sector um, people you know our, our risk management professionals our um, health services professionals are in agreement that a physically fit workforce is the right thing to do one just because it makes people healthier that's the main goal But also, fiscally, it is a very right thing to do because a physically fit workforce certainly has a much lower health care cost for the employer, which is a significant expense for any organization. And so, so keeping the focus on that, 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 everyone agrees on that. How to, to accomplish that is, is up for different strategies, different solutions. The perspective from a lot of our risk management professionals is if the firefighter is, is working out and um, um, is, is lifting weights and ends up tearing um, a, a rotor cuff in, in their shoulder, then there's um, off-duty time that you're hiring somebody overtime. There's um, expensive surgeries. You know, it's very expensive, certainly. And so, so it's a real concern for our risk management professionals to say, hey, you know, this, this this is when when this injury occurs on duty, that's a big liability, and that's that's that job of that risk management professional is to reduce the the fiscal liability for um, that organization for that department. So what we did to to successfully implement a different approach to physical fitness to a health and wellness culture was keeping that main idea, that main goal of a healthier, physically fit workforce is not only the right thing to do, but is a very fiscally responsible thing to do for our, our taxpayers' money. We have annual physicals, most fire departments do. We have annual physicals, and that's the first step. The annual physical is what makes the determination. That physician says, okay, one, they're fit for duty to be a firefighter. And then they go a step further. This firefighter um, has these limitations for physical fitness. <clears throat> Even though a firefighter can be fit for duty to be a firefighter, they might not need to be lifting, um, squatting uh, 400 pounds. And um, the other thing that we are in the process of implementing, and this is this is one thing that really helped our risk management folks. Um, one thing that, that was really beneficial was having peer fitness trainers, and that's what we're in the process of, of implementing now. And the, the role of that peer fitness trainer will be to take that annual physical that the firefighter has and then develop a prescribed fitness solution for that firefighter to, to accomplish goals. Um, of that firefighter. So if, that, if the, the firefighter's goal is or, or maintenance, then they have one formula for, for working out, and that peer fitness trainer obviously knows how to accomplish that and, and not have that firefighter get injured. Um, the goal might be to uh, increase um, the uh, endurance. It might be to uh, in increase cardiovascular uh, um, you know, fitness. Whatever it is, they have a peer fitness trainer that, that is trained and um, able to 
have that firefighter a prescription a prescribed workout regimen where they can accomplish goals and not have the risk of getting hurt. In the absence of that, then it's just me, Scott Burnett, going down to the gym who knows nothing about fitness. Say, hey, I'm gonna throw some weights on there and then end up with with a hernia or something like that. And so, so that was um, that was the the the, the key that really helped our risk management professionals say, hey, you know, yeah, this is a good thing, and, and this minimizes the risk of a workers' compensation injury or a thing like that. So it makes it allows us to get our goal accomplished that everybody's in agreement for, but at the same time um, minimizes that, that risk. Now, your peer fitness trainers, are they certified by somebody, or are they just the, are, the fitness enthusiasts that the department right. has identified? Right. We, we are in the process of implementing that, and we, we are – Using the IAFF's peer fitness trainer model um, to to be trained by the IAFF um, you know, peer fitness trainer uh, program, and so they will be certified uh, through that. Okay. Well, you've made a lot of changes. Uh, you know, we we covered the six key areas, but you've made a lot of changes uh, since Jeff died. Um, do you have any examples of uh, some success stories that uh, you know recently had an incident and something was done in a in a new, different, better way that uh, puts the exclamation point on the efforts, hard efforts that you all have been making to improve? Absolutely. We had a commercial structure fire at 504 Merriman Avenue. Um, almost a year ago, and there were um, several college students who were living above a tattoo shop, and about 3 a.m., the report of the structure fire came in, and uh, we did not know that there were um, college students living above this tattoo shop, and it was a working fire, and the um, one of the um, students who was living on the second floor of this two-story building they were able to um, escape on their own and they met the initial arriving companies and, and said that they had additional roommates that were trapped on the second floor so we put a lot of resources into searching that second floor being the, the, the biggest risk that we had on the fire ground that, that life risk we actually had a search group of eight personnel led by a search group leader in the past we would have dumped a lot of resources onto the second floor but they would not have been coordinated it would have been three companies three companies working independently i'm trying to search that floor under the group concept we had eight firefighters up there that were working in concert maximizing efficiency and able to search that area very quickly and that second arriving battalion chief is the one who is able to assume that um, search group supervisor role and keep everything coordinated. Commander has to focus on that search group, not all those different companies that are working together. So that search group doing that search function. We were able to rescue two people from that fire. And because of our RIT staffing, we were able to have secondary means of egress placed at windows on the second floor of that building. The incident commander, who was assisted by the command technician in keeping all of these personnel and the strategies, the tactics, where people were, where their air supply was, they were able to track everything, and the incident commander was able to focus just on strategies and the tactics. So when the warning signs of a flashover on the first floor were observed by the incident commander, she immediately ordered an evacuation. And we had eight firefighters on the second floor. And we have a, a, a video of this fire that was, that was the dash cam from the battalion chief's vehicle. And you can see the hand lights on the second floor of the firefighters still searching after making these rescues. They were searching for additional, unfortunately there were no other um, students up there trapped, but they were searching just to make sure. And so when the, the flash ever started to occur, the incident commander, she ordered an immediate evacuation. Since that group 
supervisor was the single point of contact and the group supervisor, the search group supervisor, knew exactly where everybody was on that second floor doing the search, they were able to order everyone out and get everyone out safely just, just in time before the entire first floor was consumed in a flashover. The accountability was quick and they were able to get out because of the multiple secondary means of egress. And then also one thing that occurred after the um, evacuation, one of the company officers um, made an emergency transmission that they had a firefighter who was unaccounted for. As quick as that transmission was made, the group supervisor was able to stand down that emergency traffic because that firefighter was accounted for. They just came out a different window. They just become separated from their company. And the division group supervisor, who only had to focus on the function of searching that second floor, was able to maximize accountability and was focused on just that one task. If that would have been given to the incident commander, the incident commander never would have been able to manage everything else going on on the fire ground. Notice the flash over. Call it, <laughs> excuse me, call for the, um, the evacuation and have maximum accountability. So we would have had an unaccounted for firefighter, and we would have sent personnel back into that building um, above a flash over on the second floor trying to find this firefighter who was not really missing, and we would have certainly had firefighters injured or, or worse. And so that was a huge success story of how increased RIT, increased um, incident management team really made a, a positive outcome for the safety of our firefighters. We also have um, a, another success story of the improvements that we made. 39 Banks Avenue, we had a fire, and it really talks about our prevention efforts and how important um, the, the work on the front end, the working, you know, our, our firefighters who are responsible for code enforcement that are in these buildings and our companies who are in these buildings during pre-plans um, working together to identify if this building is on fire, then it's really going to be a dangerous situation because it's already in trouble and it's not on fire yet. So we have, we have buildings that have... Um, placarded with a, a big red X if they are a um, structure where we're going to use conscious caution we are going to use caution when we arrive on scene and there's that placarded red X it's also loaded in CAD so we get that information um, on arrival or in route and we we know okay this this building before it caught on fire was already in distress and so now that it's on fire it's really in distress well, 39 Banks Avenue was one of those buildings, and it had a lot of open void spaces in the floors, and the second floor was a risk of collapsing. <clears throat> About five minutes after our initial company made access to that building, once they made access through the garage door, they stayed outside, and they had a big, large access, but they were able to use their fire streams from the outside and attack the fire on the inside that way. Before, we would have made an aggressive interior attack on that building. About five minutes after the arrival of that first arriving company, the second floor did collapse. And so those firefighters would have been inside when that collapsed had they not had that information on the front end from the pre-plan and from the work um, of, of our code enforcement firefighters. So those are two, two real good examples of um, how the improvements that we've made are, are certainly making a difference just, just within the last 12 months. Scott, was the criteria for a building to get a red X put on the front of it is this is this a, a policy that had to be approved from council or from the fire department or you know who who authorizes somebody to or who or what authorizes somebody to put a red X on the front of a building the uh, how that process goes is um, the um, either through a pre-plant or through a periodic fire inspection, we notice that there are holes in the roof, that there are missing or damaged um, stairs, interior stairs, that there are um, holes or void spaces in floors. Um, any, any of those indicators that are going to indicate a potential uh, collapse or rapid progression of fire, um, then 
we we post that and that that is um, it goes up through our chain of command the division chief level which is where our fire marshal is as well as our shift chiefs are and those division chiefs approve um, that that building becomes placarded and so it's it's at, at the um, the level at the lowest level possible to to make sure that um, it doesn't go through a long list of approvals. If we have a building that's in trouble, we want that information um, out there to our firefighters as quick as possible. The uh, the, the the policy and the procedure um, we we did run that through our uh, our council, our public safety committee, and our city council to get that that approved. They're very supportive of that. And, and um, one of the uh, one of the risks is to the the property owner. Um, a lot of these buildings were for sale because they were dilapidated buildings, and one of the risks that we were concerned with was a property owner would not want a big red X on their building as they're trying to to sell their property. And so we wanted to make sure that that our we had the full support of our council before we went into that that program, and they're very supportive of that. How many buildings do you have with red X's in Asheville? Uh, right now we have 24. And we are working with our um, development services department, which is our building safety officials. Um, when, when we have these identified with a red X, then we go through a process of working with that, that property owner of either rehabilitating the structure so that it is safe or demolishing the structure, and and we've been been successful with that because it certainly makes the property uh, more valuable when it has either a refurbished structure or a, a demolished structure when it gets to that condition. And does the red X mean no entry for firefighters? It means that we're going to use caution, um, and, and it is the incident commander, the company officer, its information as they um, approach that scene using different extremes that the building is fully involved with fire clearly we're not going to make an entry on the other extreme is if we have um, someone who has a burn 55 gallon metal barrel inside and they are burning some straw to to stay warm and so um, there's smoke showing light smoke showing but there's no fire in the structure sure we're going to go in and, and get that person um, out of that vacant building those are two extremes that are no-brainers, and um, what we have for our company officers is that information that says, hey, as, you're, as you are doing your risk analysis for this structure where you are going to risk a lot to save a lot and risk nothing to save nothing, we, we give you this one more piece of information because it's not just a big red X. It also has written on there, it says RO, hit the roof is open, or it'll say um, the... Um, uh, HF for holes in the floor. So it gives them information of exactly what what the uh, what the problem is with that building. And so if there is any level of fire involvement, we're not going to go inside. Okay. It makes a lot of sense. Yes, sir. I would imagine there'd be a lot of communities that would benefit from having a system like that. Most definitely. Scott, I heard you present once on uh, the incident where uh, Captain Bowen died, and you had said that line of duty deaths and the reports that followed line of duty deaths were things that you read and passed around at your department as uh, things that happened to somebody else but wouldn't happen to us, and then it happened to you. So if you could, in summary, talk to firefighters, battalion chiefs, safety officers, and fire chiefs, and share the wisdom of the walk that you have walked since Jeff died, and say, and say here are, and I'll, I'll say five, but I won't hold you to five, but here are the things that I would say, knowing what I know now, that you really need to be paying a lot of attention to because we thought we were good at this and we thought we were good at that and we still got bit so you need to assess these things and make sure that you're as good as at these things as you think you might be 
so you don't have a tragic outcome? What would those things be? I would say look very closely at your air management culture. You may have an air management guideline. You may be practicing air management procedures, but look at your culture. How are your firefighters truly operating when it comes to air management? Are they taking risks to where they are working until their air ma- their air supply is close to exhaustion? Or are you tracking it and knowing exactly how long it takes to get to the area of work to, to attack that fire and then to be able to get out with a reserve for emergency? So look at your air management culture. Train with your minimum staffing. Whatever your true minimum staffing is, train to that level. Don't ever have a training evolution where you have your maximum staffing. Always train with your minimum staffing. Do critical tasking. Don't take my word for it in that four is optimal for your incident management team and 13 is optimal for your RIT. Do your own critical tasking. Get out on the training ground and find out, okay, how many objectives can we accomplish in the time frame that we need to accomplish with two people in our incident management team? If we had a third, what does that do for us if we had a fourth? And do the same thing for RIT. If you normally have a four-person RIT, find out what their capabilities are and what will it do if you add five, six, seven, eight more. Train your firefighters on May Day, not so much as to how to call a May Day, but when to call a May Day. That's one thing that we really miss in the fire service. Burton Clark uh, National Fire Academy did research uh, 15 years ago um, that talked about this, and we're still not getting it in the fire service. We need to train our firefighters when to call a May Day. Health and wellness, very, very important. Have a strong health and wellness culture for your department. The benefits are tremendous, not only for the right reasons of having everyone healthy and able to go home the next shift and enjoy a long-lasting retirement, but there's also fiscal benefits to a healthy and well workforce also. Wow. There are some pretty amazing, pretty amazing takeaways. Um, I'm sure you probably, you know, prior to July 28th, 2011, never thought that these areas were exposure areas for you, right? Absolutely. You had to you had to experience your catastrophe to realize your your opportunities here. Is that fair? Absolutely, it's very fair. We um, we we were then just as we are now an extremely good department. We were an aggressive department. We were a department that was focused heavily on training. We were internationally accredited. We felt as if we were one of the best fire departments in our region and it certainly took a tragedy to expose these boys and but the fire department doesn't have to go through that there, there are no other departments have experienced other departments have seen and and had these lessons shown to them as well and so to the other departments out there take note of, of these very important things because there's very few in the fire service that are doing those things well. In closing, the fire at 4485 Biltmore was uh, ruled an arson. So that makes Jeff's death a murder. Yeah. Has there been any progress toward trying to so- to solving this crime? We, we, we continue to make progress. And we certainly um, refuse to get discouraged. Um, we do not have um, anyone um, who has been arrested to date, and it's been over three years. Uh, that certainly is frustrating, but it does not um, slow down our progress. We, we, it's a very active investigation to this date, and we, we continue working diligently, um, processing new information, uh, ruling, ruling people out, Working, working hard on this very active investigation, and we'll continue to do that until we find out who is responsible. Well, I, I hope that that person is is caught and and brought to justice. Scott, Absolutely. thank you for taking time away from your 
busy schedule. I know, especially today, you had a big snow event in Asheville, and uh, we were right. kind of chuckling about that because I'm from Minnesota, and <laughs> your definition of a snow event and my definition of a snow event, I think, are on two different planes, but it's all relative to geography. But uh, you had a, a pretty uh, pretty tough day today, and uh, we had to set aside the uh, the first time that we had for the for the podcast because you were you were uh, tied up with uh, trying to keep the the uh, business of running the fire department in in uh, in the forefront of your mind as it should be. Uh, but I appreciate right. you taking some time uh, this afternoon to to sit and talk with me about the event that uh, happened on July 28, 2011, and how your department has learned from it and grown from it. I'm so impressed with the things that Asheville has done and so proud to have been played just a very, very tiny part of of helping you guys uh, work through that and and take those lessons and, and bring them to life and, and, and literally uh, go through a, a metamorphosis of... Of, of a fire department. You took a great fire department and had a tragic event and you said we're gonna we're gonna take a great department and we're gonna make it even better. And the credit Absolutely. to everybody there who has uh, taken that mindset and and run with it and for to you as the leader. I just cannot say enough uh, about how impressed I am with the things that you've y'all have done in Asheville. Thank you and thank you for all of your, your help with that. Thank you again to Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett for sharing the lessons learned in Asheville following Captain Bowen's death and the many changes your department has undertaken. Thanks again to my guest, Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and 87,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you, or someone you care about, works in a high-risk, high-consequence, decision-making environment, then we are here to help to improve their safety and survival, and to help them accomplish the most important mission of all. And that is to go home to the ones who love them. Since the start of the pandemic, I have had some amazing opportunities to present my programs on a virtual platform to groups ranging in size from 6 to 400. Over the past two weeks, I've had the honor of delivering four live programs for the Red Deer Emergency Services in Alberta and a Situation Awareness Program for the University of Maryland's EMS Degree Program students. It seems like we might be making the turn in returning to live events. Here's where we're going to be upcoming. On October 12th, I'll be at the Waconia Fire Department in Waconia, Minnesota, delivering a program, or should say facilitating, a discussion on mission, vision, and core values. October 16th, I'll be at the La Crosse Fire Department in La Crosse, Wisconsin, facilitating a program called Leaders Toolbox, Building Tomorrow's Leaders Today. On October 19th through 21, I'll be at the Clark County Fire District No. 6 in Washington, delivering three days of fire ground situational awareness. November 3rd, a situation awareness and thermal imaging program, a virtual event with Andy Starnes from Insight Training. And November 17 through 19 at the Anchorage Fire Department in Anchorage, Alaska, where I'll be doing two programs for firefighters and one program for their communications professionals. Thank you to the organizations who've allowed me to offer virtual training for your teams and a special thanks to the departments that are now hosting live events. If you're interested in hosting a virtual program or a live event, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage, and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check out the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter, how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 341 of the Situation Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Asheville Fire Chief Scott Burnett. Thank you to our amazing platinum sponsor for six years now, Midwest Fire. 
Thank you to our feature segment sponsor, Gasway Virtual Training, and thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. And most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.